point around how it is that the any any impact of um, any sort of trauma is what often is the case is that it, it's we stay up in that alert place and that can be not even only from our own experiences but from generations before us can actually lead us to stay more in that stress place and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second but so it leads us often to then continue to have challenges around attention and focus around emotion so a little bit of emotion can then you know feeling bad can sense you skyrocketing feeling good can also have a powerful impact relationships the world feels unsafe so safer to be aggressive or compliant so I mentioned those pieces earlier earlier today the real key I think in these is that they're all things that we then often put labels on and then when we put it labels then we end up going much more to a place that is more about we've got to, f to fix them rather than seeing that they come out of survival mechanisms. So when we start with an understanding that our brain is shaped to survive, then we can actually start feeling good about what the brain does rather than, oh, well, there's something wrong. I am all these problem things. Instead, it's like, no. I have a brilliant brain that adapted. Now the task is to take it further. So experience shapes the brain. And it's important to know, I think, that our parents and grandparents' experiences shape our brains too. It adds, I think, more understanding to how it is that the um, impacts of residential school, the impacts of past wars, even ones that our parents, grandparents were part of, impacts of some of the traumas that our parents and grandparents have experienced. And this is very, very new research that is actually showing that our parents and grandparents' experiences turn on and off DNA. So it, there was this wonderful finding uh, in Sweden, but I'll... I'll Go on to another little video clip to just tell us a little bit more about that. We are on the brink of uncovering a hidden... Which is why I think it is then so important to actually say, if we know how our brain works, we know what it is that causes our brain to shift in these ways, then we can start re-sculpting it. And that's where, that's where for me the hope is we now understand that actually brains are shaped, they are shaped and changing and we understand now that neuroplasticity, sorry, I keep standing no, 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 in your no, road and no, then worrying about the no, camera no, no. versus your road to the, <laughs> to the projector. Um, so we now understand that neuroplasticity works throughout the entire lifespan. It's not the way it used to be believed as only in the first five years of life. And we now understand that if we can change our own brain, we change the conditions that then shape our children's brains and our grandchildren's brains. So it's like we, there is enormous hope and enormous sense of possibility. And the more we understand about our brains and the more those we're trying to support in learning understand about their brains, the more they can re-sculpt them. So that, I think, is the, is the core of this. We can reshape brains. And it, every experience helps us to do that. Let's, let's go on to how can we sculpt it. I'm going to draw from some of Dan Siegel's work because his imagery, I think, just gives us something to, to play with. This is his image of mental health is his, in, his idea being in the flow, in the boat that is going down the river and that can cope with what eventualities come. He argues that all the mental illnesses really fall into either side of that flow. The chaos, overwhelm, complete muddle, the other side, the rigidity and, uh, and that sense of being having to be in control. And so he argues that 
once it becomes really entrenched as a pattern on either side, then that it becomes something that we begin to call a mental illness. Something like, I mean, the perfect example is obsessive compulsive disorder. Clearly, that's that degree of rigidity of trying to control the world. And chaos, overwhelm, there's all sorts of versions of. But we don't have to go as far as labeling it as mental illness. We also all have moments where we slide either way. We feel chaos, overwhelmed, can't cope, sort of internally and externally, or we're gripping onto things really tight and saying, it's got to be this way, because we can't bear, it feels impossible to let it go. Health is that we go to either side, and we're able to kick ourselves off back into the flow before too long. And it, when it becomes really entrenched one way or the other, that's where it's becoming problematic. And it's really becoming clearer and clearer that it is our experiences that shape, and as I say, our parents' and our grandparents' experiences, that shape the patterns that we, get, we call mental illness. Not only the ones that we usually recognize as coming from trauma, like post-traumatic stress disorder, but the others too. If you dig back a few generations, usually it's clear that there is trauma, even if it's not in the person's own life. So there's a bit of a contested field now in the mental health of those who are saying, Trauma, violence really contributes to these patterns and those who are saying, no, 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 it's just a chemical imbalance. But the question I think when, for those who argue chemical imbalance is, so why a chemical imbalance? <laughs> and, and I think often then we can see that the issue with trauma is, as was shown in that first little clip, if we are responding to trauma all the time, then what's being kicked out into our systems is the cortisol and the adrenaline that are preparing us for fight and fleeing and for freezing, especially if we are more vulnerable, we're more likely to freeze. If we are more powerful as an adult or finding a way to be more capable, then we're more likely to go to fight and fleeing. But a tiny baby is going to freeze. And, and so we're going to see those different reactions then staying in place if that's what experience has shaped us to. So if we can understand the brain a little bit more, it's quite helpful. So Dan also has a, a drawing for us to think about the brain. And it, I think this is a lovely way of avoiding having to get caught in every name of every part of the brain because there are a lot of names. They're very hard to remember. And that doesn't feel so empowering as getting a general sense of the brain. So Dan Siegel talks about our downstairs brain and our upstairs brain. And the downstairs is where, as he would put it, the plumbing is and the, all the you know, supplies. And upstairs is where it's more expansive, more possibility. Upstairs is where the planning, the thinking, the imagining happens up there. And it's in this lower area that these immediate reactions of anger and fear and so on come. I think the one word name that it is quite helpful to know is this idea that it's the amygdala. That's the part of the brain that fires up whenever we're in fight or flight or freeze mode. That's the part that is saying, alert, alert. It's a little bit like the fire alarm going off with flashing lights and, and s s loads of sound. That is what's telling us. And it's the most basic part of our, of our brain, really, it just is trying to keep us alive. So like the fire alarm where you aren't supposed to stop and say, now exactly what's the problem here? It's like, get out of here now this second because it might threaten your life. And so that's our amygdala fires up. And if, as I've shown in that idea of the toxic stress, if we've had a lot of stress, then that amygdala fires up as if it's life-threatening at the tiniest bit of anxiety. So it's really important to understand that, because then we understand, OK, well, my brain is actually trying to protect me. It's trying to keep me alive. Or my students' brains, when it seems like they're doing things that just get in the way of their learning, get in the way, like they don't seem constructive, say, but that amygdala is trying to keep them alive. And when the amygdala is firing to try and keep us alive, has no interest at all in long-term survival because long-term survival might not happen. 
It's only focused on immediate survival. And that's when all sorts of physiological reactions come. It, it mobilizes every iota of glucose it can find in order to give us more energy. That's one of the reasons that we're now seeing so much diabetes. If we're, if we're in flight or, flight or fight mode, then all our glucose is being mobilized, is being brought into the system. We crave more glucose because we need it for that energy that the cortisol and adrenaline is telling us that we need because it's saying life-threatening moment here. Yes, do ask questions whenever you want. Go. Is that good for you that you're saying or is it bad? It's good for you to survive in the moment. I mean when you're taking all that stuff. If it's staying on all the time, it's terribly bad for us. So that's why it's so important for us to learn to come down from it. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So it's focused on immediate survival. It's pumping out cortisol. It's pumping out adrenaline. It's saying, give you enough strength to run 100 times faster than you would ever be able to run in order to outrun the tiger that is about to catch you. And it's sending all your blood supply to your arms, to your legs. That's why you'll see so many folks with legs vibrating, because it is giving us energy. That's what it's designed to do. And so understanding that it's designed to do that, and given the sorts of ways that our thermostat may have just been cranked up, or the students we're working with, thermostat is cranked up, then we've got to figure out how to bring it back down again. So. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit more. But seeing, sort of understanding that that's a little bit about the brain can be helpful. And that, you know, when we've got our blood supply rushing to our limbs, it's not going to our stomach to help our digestion, for instance. But more importantly in learning, it's not going to the upstairs brain to help us in planning and thinking. It's not good survival. We don't want to stop and think. We, we, in the immediate emergency moment, we want to just get out of there. And so, it, it, we've not, so we may find ourselves actually teaching a group of students who, if, if their brains have been shaped by experiences of violence, they're anxious in the classroom, they have no blood supply to the part of the brain we would like them to use to think creatively, to engage with our math lesson, and so on. So we've got to help them understand the brain and shift so that they can come down and get out of that place and get the blood supply coming back where we need it for learning. So just a couple more illustrations of the brain and what's going on. So we have a right portion to our brain, a left portion to the brain. It's not separated in the way that we used to think it was, but it's the right that's connected to that firing from the amygdala the right and the emotional mode. It's where that feeling, instant feeling of anger or uh, huge wells of, of feeling, they come from that immediate connection from the amygdala to there. What's challenging is trauma makes the link between the two halves of the brain weaker. And so the more we can help to strengthen the connection between the right mode and the left mode, the, the E easier it is to bring the left and logical and linear part on, on sort of online. It's a bit like a computer. It's a computer. It's like a piece of it's offline for the moment. We want to bring it in. That's where the language center is too. So we need to strengthen connections between right and left mode because right is just getting its messages fired up from the amygdala if the amygdala is on alert. So we may think we're teaching students, but they actually may be all on alert mode and not hearing or seeing anything. So what can we do about it? That's really the next question.